An Alaskan fishing town of 600 inhabitants was stunned by the horrifying news that a family of four, along with four deckhands, were slain aboard their vessel in 1982. The boat had been set alight and all of those on board had been shot by a .22 caliber gun. With the motive and murderer still uncertain, this haunting case remains as Alaska's biggest unsolved murder mystery. With the salmon fishing season coming to an end, the settlement of Craig, located in southeastern Alaska, was bustling with fishermen, eager to complete their final catches and return to their loved ones. The 6th of September 1982 began with a thick fog lingering in the morning air. The engines of the Investor, an $850,000, 58-foot Delta Marine Saner, roared into motion with a stranger on board. He navigated his way to a secluded area approximately a mile from shore, nonchalantly greeting a passing skipper with a wave, the sailor completely unaware that on the deck, eight people lay deceased. Abandoning the vessel at a cove near Fish Egg Island, the man returned to shore using the investor's skiff, returning the following afternoon with a canister of gasoline. The investor was set ablaze and the perpetrator rushed back to shore and subsequently vanished. Former police chief Ray Shapley recalled the moment he arrived to the crime scene. When I got there, black smoke was coming out of the wheelhouse, but there was nobody on deck. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Two days earlier, on Sunday the 5th of September, the Coolthurst family, Mark Coolthurst and his pregnant wife Irene, both 28 years of age, along with their children Kimberly, aged 5, and John, aged 4, were accompanied by deckhands Chris Heyman of San Rafael, California, aged 18, Mike Stewart from Bellingham, Washington, who was Mark's cousin, Dean Moon and Jerome Keown from Blaine, Washington, all of whom were 19 years old. They attended a birthday celebration together at a restaurant located by the waterfront, each taking turns at using a payphone at the laundromat. The investor had arrived to the dock later in the afternoon, however this was not particularly unusual, as Mark Coolthurst, a hard-working and popular skipper who was proud of his investment, would give tours of his boat. Like other fellow skippers, Mark and his family were winding down, excited to return home to Blaine, Washington. Irene and the children were booked on a flight back to their hometown on Monday the 6th, and Kimberly was set to start kindergarten that week. What happened on the night of Sunday the 5th is unknown, however authorities believe that the family and deckhands returned to the investor that night at around 9.30pm as a storm was coming. Their killer crept aboard and shot each individual multiple times with a .22 caliber. Speaking with other fishermen, it was reported that at around 6am the following morning, the boat was seen drifting around the dock. A figure was seen standing in the wheelhouse. A deckhand on the deckade remembered waving to this person. With the investor hidden from view in the cove later that day, a man purchased two and a half gallons of gasoline in Craig, boarded the skiff and sailed back out towards the boat. At 4pm, crew members of the trawler Casino witnessed smoke rising from the investor. They pulled away from the dock and headed towards the vessel. The skipper recalled, the fire was so intense, I wasn't able to get within 50 feet. 
On the way, they passed the skiff with the mysterious man on board, who eventually reached Craig Docks. Whilst passing him on the water, the skipper of the casino yelled, Look for anyone alive. Witnesses noted that the man spoke with three people on the dock and then disappeared. The fire took many hours to extinguish and the boat was towed to shore to prevent it from sinking. Upon initial searches, with the fire temporarily at bay, the bodies of Mark, Irene, Kimberly and Mike Stewart were found in the pilot house. They all had multiple gunshot wounds. The flames worsened once more and wrecked most of the interior. The only areas unaffected by the inferno were the boat's hold and engine room, as a sprinkler system had been installed. Once the fire eventually burned out, only bone fragments remained of the other victims. Jerome Keown was able to be identified, but it was impossible to determine whether the remain fragments were that of Chris Heyman or Dean Moon. John Coulthurst's remains were never recovered, however, authorities believe that the fire was so strong that it completely destroyed the body of the infant. Authorities spent months reviewing evidence and speaking to various witnesses, however, no solid leads came until around a year after the massacre. Fishermen in Craig at the time corroborated with each other in regards to witnessing a man believed to have been the culprit. The suspect was in his 20s, was Caucasian and had a pockmarked complexion. Two years after the murders, police arrested 25-year-old John Kenneth Peel, an ex-deckhand of Mark Coulthurst. He was charged with first-degree murder and arson. Peel told authorities he was working on another vessel during that time and had actually been in bed during the murders, and his defence later claimed he was making a phone call in downtown Craig. John Peel was arrested purely based on the fact he looked similar to the composite sketch authorities created while speaking with other fishermen who saw the suspect on the day the cool thirsts and their deckhands were slain. It did come to light, however, that the gasoline that Peel had bought that day was regular gasoline, not the white gasoline used to burn the investor. During a six-month trial in 1986, prosecutors alleged that he had fallen out with Mark, who then fired him, and this argument was their reasoning for Peel's motive to kill in revenge. The trial was based more so on circumstantial evidence, and the prosecution based most of their case on the fact eyewitnesses believed to have seen John Peel purchasing the gasoline that day. Peel's defence argued that the eyewitness testimonies were inconsistent, as many of them changed their stories or were not completely certain that the man they had seen that day was definitely Peel. His attorney also stated the possibility that Mark had been involved in some sort of illegal drug trade, which is how he made his fortune and how he came to be killed. However, there was no evidence presented to support this. Another idea was that Heyman or Moon could have been involved as their remains were never identified. The result was that of a hung jury. John Peel was taken for a retrial in 1988 and was found not guilty and exonerated. Maintaining his innocence, he filed a wrongful prosecution suit against the state in order to receive enough money to cover his legal fees and a settlement was reached and John Peel received approximately $900,000. Police consider this case closed, however, it is far from being resolved. Rumours continue to swirl in Craig about the truth surrounding the murders, however, it seems the answers are no closer to being found. Former police detective David McNeil, who aided in the investigation, said, They got the right guy. Just because someone is acquitted doesn't mean they're innocent just means there is not enough evidence to show guilt beyond reasonable doubt. 
Despite authorities' belief that they found the guilty party, there is no solid evidence to convict. Was John Peel innocent or guilty? Peel told People magazine that somebody out there knows what happened. Somebody was responsible for this. Somebody out there knows what happened, but I'm not going to waste any more of my life on it. Laurie Hart, the younger sister of Mark Coulthurst, agreed to meet with John Peel at a diner, having spent years of being convinced he was guilty of the crime. After their meeting in 2016, Laurie is firm of the belief that I don't know if he's actually the one who pulled the trigger, but I think he knows more than he's saying. Who executed eight innocent people and what were the reasons behind it? Was it an act of revenge? A drug deal gone awry? Perhaps a fresh look at the case with modern forensics would open up new possibilities. The mystery continues to manifest within the tiny fishing village, and even though it has been over 36 years since the tragedy, the family and friends of those who lost their lives continue to hope that they will at last find the answers they seek, and justice for the victims of the tragic events that unfolded on that fateful night. On the night of the 12th of July 1984, a couple pitched their tent in a wooded area by Lake of Wallop Apoyaura, located in the mountainous Swedish province of Lapland. They were 34-year-old Janni and 39-year-old Marinus Stiegahoys, who were both from Almelo in the Netherlands. Earlier that evening, they had arrived by car at the camping ground between 4.30pm and 6pm, quickly choosing a remote yet crowded area and cooked their dinner on a stove before retiring to bed between 9pm and 10pm. Their trip had been planned for quite some time and the pair, who were keen photographers and nature lovers, were eager to travel in the land of the midnight sun, through the North Kalot region and wished to visit Yelovori, which lay seven miles from the campground, the Northern Cape and eventually arrive in Finland. The couple were last seen by Jarl Carlson, who saw them refueling their vehicle in Skaulo, 124 miles from the campsite by Lake Apoyaura. Around 24 hours later, on the 13th of July, at approximately 10pm, the Yelavara police received a phone call from a member of a family from Gothenburg, who informed them that they had found a collapsed, blood-stained tent with what looked like two lifeless bodies resting beneath the fabric. The security officer and on-duty inspector quickly arrived on the scene with a search dog and, at first glance, noticed the abandoned car, collapsed tent, a makeshift sitting and dining area along with a camping stove, discarded food wrappers and beer cans. The Toyota Corolla the couple had arrived to the site in was locked and was untouched, according to police. However, later reports stated that some personal items were missing from the vehicle, which was eventually scrapped in the Netherlands. After examining the scene, they approached the tent. Opening the tent, a filleting knife, which was absent of its tip, suddenly fell out. Within the tent lay the bodies of Marinus and Yanni Stiegohois, who had been brutally stabbed to death, with slashes and a high volume of blood present on both of their bodies. Other members of the police were alerted to the crime scene and it was found that there were numerous cuts, estimated as being around 100 to the tent itself, many of which penetrated through the canvas and fatally wounded the couple, reportedly up to 30 stab wounds each. Marinus also had a bruise on his face. The missing tip of the fillet knife was recovered and was determined to have belonged to the Stiegohoises. 
It was determined by Swedish authorities that the perpetrator had used two knives to commit the murders, the second of which was thought to have had a much wider blade in comparison to the fillet knife and was brought to the scene by the killer. Police concluded that the attack was random and carried out by an extremely violent and irrational person who was likely around 30 years old and was familiar with the Apoyaura area and its surroundings, including the village of Yelavori. Personal items belonging to the victims, such as an Olympus OM-10 camera and lens, a gold necklace, traveller's checks and a Mellotron cassette radio were missing. However, Yanni's purse was found in a ditch a few miles from the tent. The crime was also committed in broad daylight. Even though it was in nighttime hours, it was the time of year where Sweden experiences 24 hours of daylight, hence the nickname of the country being the land of the midnight sun. Unfortunately, any DNA evidence retrieved at the crime scene was lost or destroyed. The previous evening, on the night of the murders, it had been raining frequently, which meant that any evidence, such as footprints, were washed away. Piecing together the evidence they had, which included a diary with a final entry dated on the 12th of July, police determined that the Dutch couple had been killed between midnight and 2am on the 13th of July. Due to an error in the initial search, police did not gather witness testimonies of other campers and could not verify the people who were present near and around the campsite that night. Approximately nine miles from the crime scene near a forest, a brown briefcase was found in a bog by a berry picker on the 22nd of July, who notified authorities of their discovery. The briefcase did not belong to the deceased couple, however, after inspecting its contents, police were able to determine that documents, a handbag and a passport found inside the briefcase belonged to Yanni Stiegohois, and the sheath for the fillet knife was also recovered. After close examination, no further clues were evident on the items which left police frustrated. In May 1985, the missing cassette was found in a trench 10 miles north of the scene of the murder. The camera bag was found in the possession of a man in Stockholm, who had found the bag in the autumn of 1984. He became curious about the owner of the bag when he found out about the murders, as there was a name etched on a label inside the camera bag which said Stiegohois. After realising the connection of the bag to an unsolved murder, he disposed of the contents with little value, which included 20 rolls of used film. Swedish police, who were working alongside Dutch police on the case, failed to identify the reasons as to both how and why the bag ended up in Stockholm. The family that had initially found the bodies of Marinus and Yanni reported seeing someone on a bicycle a few miles from the campsite, and on the 14th of July, the day following the double murder, police questioned a West German cyclist who was en route to Yelovori. The 33-year-old man cooperated with authorities and explained that he had cycled to Sweden via Denmark following midsummer and had originally started his journey in the city of Wuppertal in West Germany. He had not intended on staying in Sweden as he had planned on going to the archipelago of Lofoten in Norway, but he was forced to turn around when no road would take him further across the Norwegian border. It became apparent that the man was a professional boxer who was a member of the national team and held a criminal record. He stated that he had camped within fairly close proximity of the Stiego houses and, during interrogation, appeared to not only talk derogatorily about human beings in general, but also avoided some questions and gave vague answers. He had no belongings or money on him other than the clothes on his back and his bike, and he stated that he would go fishing in order to survive in the wilderness. 
Despite his criminal past, narrow-mindedness and apparently violent character, police could not firmly link him to the murders and further witness statements proving he was not at the campsite determined that it was impossible for him to have committed the crime. Another suspect was identified by police and was known only as the bodybuilder, who was a 31-year-old man who was allegedly involved with a group of violent people in the area. He was familiar to Swedish police and was known to abuse drugs and alcohol. He was present in the Apoljaura area on the night of the murders with two other people. According to two separate witnesses, the trio were reportedly intoxicated and left lots of discarded items behind in the camping ground and its surroundings. The two companions were unable to provide police with an alibi for the bodybuilder but explained that he had left them for a while that night, only to return covered in blood. He told them with a knife in hand that he had killed a reindeer. Despite the suspicious circumstances, the incident could not be verified and police never pursued the man further. He is not considered a suspect in the case. Eight years later, the bodybuilder was serving a prison sentence and allegedly admitted his guilt to a fellow inmate. Apparently, he became angry with his friends and left the pair alone. As the evening progressed, he found the campsite of the Stiega Hoises and, believing them to be his companions, killed them in a rage. Police investigated this claim, however, when questioning the inmate, were not given any answers. In 1996, the bodybuilder attempted to break in to a retirement home which was five miles from the 1984 crime scene. The residents barricaded the entry to the dwelling and, in an uncontrollable rage, the man cut off his forearm using an axe and bled to death. Swede Sturi Ragnar Berval, also known as Thomas Quick, who was believed to have been a serial killer, having admitted to at least 30 murders whilst incarcerated in a psychiatric institution due to personality disorders, was for a time considered a suspect in the case. He allegedly admitted to the Apoya Retent murders in 1994 and volunteered to assist authorities in carrying out reconstructions of what happened on the night of the killings. Berval was convicted of the crime in 1996, despite lack of evidence and the fact he provided a lot of incorrect information during the reconstructions. He then recanted his confession, and in 2013, the conviction was overturned, acquitting Berval of the crime. Many tips were given to police during the 1990s. However, since Berval was convicted of the murders, authorities did not follow up on any of the tips. There are several theories regarding what could have happened, however it is believed that the couple were victims of a random attack, carried out by a mentally unstable individual. The motive for such an attack, unclear. Over three decades have passed since Marinus and Janni Stiegohuis were murdered in their tent on a summer night in Sweden. No further clues or answers have come to light and the case has gone cold. The Ajon Barat farm was located a few hundred metres away from the village of Baumier, Indre, central France. Within its walls lived the Carteron family, which consisted of Kleber Carteron, his wife Alphonsine, the couple's young son André and Claude Goddard, a ward. Like millions of other people around the world, they were adjusting to a new way of life following the conclusion of the Second World War. It was Thursday the 25th of July 1946 and 35-year-old Jeanne Jugen, a neighbour of the Carterons, stepped outside for a moment to take a breath of fresh air. Her surroundings were unusually quiet, and turning her eyes towards the Carteron farm, a feeling of dread washed over her. 
The family had not been seen since the 21st of July. Despite the fact the Carterons and Jeanne used a single road, she had not seen any of them within those four days. Jeanne wandered towards the dwelling, calling for her neighbours. However, she was only met with silence. Around the property, which lay just 100 metres from her own home, she observed that many of the daily farming tasks had not been completed, giving her a further sense of unease. Peeking through the windows, she could see that the furniture was heavily damaged and much of the Carteron's possessions were carelessly scattered around the interior. Through a broken window, she gasped as she saw two lifeless bodies. Panicked, Jeanne darted back to her house to raise the alarm with her husband. Police and the mayor of Ambro were notified of the Jugend's worries. The Chateau Rue prosecutor's office successfully sought help from the authorities in Limoges to accompany the Ambro police to the Carteron farm. Once they arrived, along with a handful of senior members of the police, it was found that the front door was locked. Without a key, they received aid from a locksmith who broke the lock, providing entry to the farmhouse. It is worth noting that the key was never found, despite an extensive search. Entering the kitchen, the Carteron family and Claude were lying face down on the slab floor, with their wrists and ankles bound behind them. All four of them had been shot execution style in the back of their heads, and the Carteron's dog was curled up in his bed, also deceased. The property had been ransacked, however it appeared that nothing had been stolen, authorities assuming the mess to have been a red herring left by the perpetrators, and there was no evidence to suggest any sort of struggle from the victims. The Carterons were described as a modest and very poor family, therefore it seemed unlikely that robbery was the motive for the crime. French media reported that six spent bullet cases and two unused were recovered from the scene, with investigators believing that the weapon had more than likely malfunctioned during the killings. Bloodhounds couldn't trace the murder weapon, however an expert gunsmith examined the bullets and casings and linked them to a British-built Sten submachine gun, which was commonly used by the Allies and the Axis during World War II. Stens produce very little noise when firing bullets, which matches with statements from the Jugends, who did not hear anything suspicious in the days their neighbours were absent. There was a man in the area called Captain Jacques who owned a Sten gun and he was allegedly quite a colourful and controversial character. He led a group of resistance fighters from L'Armée Secrète, a French military organisation that operated during World War II, and it was also suggested that a group involved in Germany's werewolf resistance could have been involved. Authorities never retrieved Captain Jack's gun, therefore a comparison could not be made against the murder weapon. It is also unknown if a ballistic analysis was carried out. Police questioned many people in the area. Although folk from Berry, around 26 kilometres or 16 miles away near Chateau Rue, were not particularly eager to speak to the authorities for reasons unknown. There have been several theories regarding the events leading up to the murders, which were believed to have taken place on the day they were last seen, the 21st of July 1946. A man at the nearby Paso farm who had been friendly with Kleber Carteron told a tale from the previous winter, where Carteron voiced concerns that he had a feeling he was being stalked. Carteron recalled at least two occasions where he believed someone was following him up the track he travelled on to return to the farm, but there was no evidence of who the individual was or even whether there was proof to confirm his fears. 
there is also the possibility that the family, or at least a member of the family, was involved in activities during the war, for example espionage, but no evidence was present to back up this theory. Whether or not they had any enemies is up for question, but with every interview conducted with friends and neighbours, they seemed content with life and didn't appear agitated or anxious. A rumour which circulated in the local area suggested that Kleber had been wandering in the woods and had accidentally stumbled into the centre of a French resistance operation, where fighters were seizing a loot which had been airdropped into the forest. Resistance fighters did possess the same type of gun as the murder weapon, but once again, the reason as to why one of the fighters would kill Kleber as well as Alphonsine, Andre and Claude is a puzzling mystery. In the days following the murders, a bag which had belonged to Kleber was found abandoned in the nearby woodland, along with a notebook. It is unknown what content lay within the pages of the book, however it was reportedly a school book. Over a week after the items were discovered, a lumberjack found a man-made shelter in the forest, constructed with various logs, sticks, moss and leaves. Access to the shelter, the place where personal items were found and the farm itself were all accessible by cutting across several fields. Even after the war, wanderers journeying through fields was not an uncommon sight, therefore many would not have deemed the activity particularly suspicious. Many locals blamed authorities for a lacklustre investigation, but police were still trying to find stability after the turmoil of war. The case was officially closed in April 1947 and unfortunately went cold. Three quarters of a century have passed and no further clues have come to light as to who killed the victims in cold blood and their motive for carrying out such a despicable and merciless act. The murders of Claude Godard, Kleber Carteron, Alphonsine Carteron, Andre Carteron and the family's beloved dog remains unsolved. Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseat, later known as Belle Gunnis, was born on the 22nd of November 1859 in the Norwegian village of Selbu. She was the daughter of a stonemason, and during her early life, the family suffered enormously from financial problems. As a young woman, Belle became enchanted by the American dream and driven by hopes of becoming wealthy, she packed her bags and travelled to the United States between 1881 and 1886. Money was always Belle Gunness's motivation. She did not care what it took and she went to incredible lengths in order to get what she wanted. Originally, Belle settled in Chicago, Illinois, and she went on to marry Mads Sorensen, another Norwegian immigrant, with whom she had several children, Myrtle, Lucy, Caroline and Axel, plus an adopted daughter, Jenny Olsen. Two of her children, Caroline and Axel, passed away from acute colitis, both infants' deaths providing Gunnis with insurance money. What slipped past the coroner, however, was that the symptoms shown by the children were similar to that of a person suffering from strychnine poisoning. One night, the couple's confectionery store and home was mysteriously burned to the ground. They went on to claim the insurance money for both properties. Following this incident, in 1901, Mads suddenly died from apparent heart failure on the day both of his life insurance policies overlapped. Sorensen's family were extremely suspicious about Belle and the convenience this caused her and wished for authorities to begin an inquiry, but no charges were ever brought. The doctor who examined Mad's body at first determined the cause of death as being strychnine poisoning, however this was later overruled by another medical professional and changed to heart failure. 
Once again, Belle escaped with her freedom and today's equivalent of $217,000. In 1901, the widowed Belle, along with her three children, purchased a farmhouse on 42 acres of land in Laporte, Indiana, using the money from her late husband's life insurance payout. It was reported a part of the farm also burned down, and once again, Belle collected her beloved money from the insurance. Belle met Peter Gunnis, a widower with two daughters. They married fairly quickly in April 1902, and once again, misfortune struck. Mere days after their wedding, Peter Gunnis's infant daughter died at seven months old. Peter knew with his gut instinct that something was awry, and sent his other daughter, Svanhild, away to live with her uncle. Peter Gunnis would become his wife's next victim. During the night of the 18th of December 1902, young Jenny Olsen fled to nearby neighbours, urging them to come quickly. Peter was sprawled, lifeless on the kitchen floor, Belle sobbing over him. A doctor discovered a bloody wound on the back of Mr Gunnis's skull. After being questioned by authorities, Belle explained that a meat grinder had fallen from a shelf and hit her husband on the back of his head. Of course, investigators were highly sceptical of Bell's explanation and ordered an inquest following a coroner's report indicating that Peter was indeed poisoned by strychnine. No hard evidence could be recovered and, ultimately, Gunnis was still a free woman. Six months after Peter's death, Bell Gunnis gave birth to a son, Philip. Jenny was actually overheard by classmates, confiding in friends, stating, My mama killed my papa. She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. Still desperate to fill her pockets with coins, despite raking in her second husband's life insurance payout, approximately $81,000 in today's money, Belle Gunnis turned to the Lonely Hearts columns in the Norwegian language newspapers of the Midwest. She had high hopes of luring wealthy men onto her farm, and she was successful in doing so many times. She was of an unusual stature for the time, a six foot frame and 250 pounds in weight. Although she could do all the necessary chores on the farm, in the fields, hogs pen and dairy barn, she wanted some help, not only to keep the farm ticking over, but to feed her hunger for dollars. In the autumn of 1906, young Jenny Olsen, who was 16 years old, mysteriously vanished. Belle had formed the opinion that Jenny had been a liability since the death of Peter Gunnis, so her disappearance did rouse suspicions from locals. She explained to those who were concerned that Jenny had taken up residence at a finishing school in Los Angeles, California. However, Jenny Olson was never heard from again. Residents nearby did not find it particularly surprising how many suitors Belle attracted. She was considered a beauty, tall and blonde, with a wide white smile. A string of men took it upon themselves to visit what would be known as the murder farm, from where they would never leave. A few of these men include John Moo, Henry Gerholt, Olaf Sven Herod, Ole B. Budsberg, Olaf Lindblom and Andrew Helyeline. The latter's brother, Esley Helyeline, became suspicious when he heard nothing from his brother Andrew. He wrote a letter to Gunnis inquiring about his whereabouts, however Bell told him that she had never seen him before. Despite this reply, Esley set out to travel to Laporte, however he would be too late. In July 1907, Belle had hired a new farmhand named Ray Lampier. He was 11 years her junior and fell in love with her, finding himself jealous of her various other suitors. 
Due to factors surrounding her suitors, Ray and Belle became locked in a constant battle where Belle accused Ray of harassment and he insinuated that she had been responsible for claiming the lives of her husbands and daughter. Bankers too found themselves scratching their heads at how often Belle Gunnis would cash large sums of money on behalf of the handyman she hired. Joe Maxson was hired in early 1908. On April 27th, he helped Belle unload her groceries and a full can of kerosene, which she had bought in the town. They shared a meal together before Joe retired to bed for the night. At approximately 4am, he woke to the suffocating smell of smoke. It did not take long for Maxon to realise that the house had caught fire and he instantly escaped from the property. He checked the windows of the children's bedrooms, only to find them empty. By morning, the tale only became more horrifying. Inside the blackened remains of the farmhouse, authorities recovered four human bodies, three of which were children, presumed to have been those of Lucy, Myrtle and Philip. Alongside them was a woman's corpse, however, it was headless. At first, it was believed to have been the skeletal remains of Belle Gunnis, yet upon closer inspection, it did not match as this skeleton was much smaller. Nearby, a dental bridge belonging to Belle was found, which the coroner found as sufficient evidence to confirm that the headless corpse was Belle Gunnis. During the searching of the farmstead and surrounding land, Aisley Helluline arrived to find his brother. He spoke with the sheriff and insisted that the farm be thoroughly checked. Unconvinced by what he was witnessing, Aisley spoke with Joe Maxson, asking if there were any places Bell dug holes for things like cinders. He was led to the hog's pen, where a gruesome discovery was made. Around 11 or 12 bodies were recovered in the search effort at the hog's pen, and, heartbreakingly, Aisley found the remains of his brother, Andrew, who had been dismembered and put into flour sacks. One of the other bodies belonged to Belle's foster daughter, Jenny, who had not been seen since 1906. The fields were also searched and many other remains were recovered, yet many were left unidentified. Attention quickly turned to Ray Lampier. Following the coroner's report, adamant that it was Belle's body found in the burnt-out farmstead, he was charged and put on trial. Ray was found guilty and convicted with arson, not murder, but later told authorities that he had aided Belle in burying the victims. She had killed about 42 people. She would feed them a meal, poison their coffee and hit them with the meat chopper, alternating between burying the victims in shallow graves and feeding their remains to the hogs. Many years later, whilst in prison, Ray made a deathbed confession. Days before the Inferno, which took place on the 28th of April 1908, he had travelled to Chicago to collect a new housekeeper hired by Belle Gunnis. Little did he know Belle's true intentions. Belle had concocted an evil plot. She murdered the housekeeper and removed her head, which was actually never recovered by police, using the remains as her body double in the fire she had planned to light in hopes that the authorities would believe it to be her. She drugged her children and left them in the house to perish in the fire. Ray said it was her idea all along to fake her own death, withdrawing money from her bank accounts in her escape, fleeing with what she held closest to her heart. Endless riches. Belle Gunnis had gotten away with murder. Her death was never confirmed, and recent DNA tests were inconclusive on the headless corpse. Several sightings were reported in the Chicago area, but authorities were unable to track her down. The story does not end here, however. In 1931, a woman named Elizabeth Carlson, also known as Esther, died in Los Angeles whilst awaiting trial for fatally poisoning a man. 
There was no doubt that Esther looked remarkably similar to Belle Gunnis and was of the same age, but perhaps the most incredible evidence is that she had in her possession a photograph of three children which strikingly resembled the children of Belle Gunnis. A tale full of twists and turns, the famous Norwegian-born serial killer Belle Gunnis earned herself more than notoriety. The Black Widow, The Lonely Hearts Killer, Lady Bluebeard, and The Devilish Hell's Bell. Despite so much information in this case, the fate of Bell remains unknown. Did she lose her life in the fire? If she indeed faked her own death, where did she go? Was Ray's confession the truth? Were Bell and Esther the same person? What ultimately became of Bell Gunnis? The nightmare on Murder Farm, come to an end, yet over a century on, continues to intrigue and terrify. The Hamar Deban incident is a case which has received little coverage from the media, not only in Russia and Kazakhstan, but also on an international scale. It has many eerie similarities to arguably the most famous mystery of them all, the Dyatlov Pass incident, which occurred in the Ural Mountains of Russia in 1959, where nine experienced hikers perished in unexplained circumstances. Hamar Deban is a mountain range located in Buryatia, southern Siberia. It was August of 1993, and 41-year-old Lyudmila Korovina arrived at the train station in Irkutsk and greeted with a small group of hikers she was to lead into the mountains on a Category 4 climb spanning approximately 50 miles or 80 kilometres. They were 24-year-old Tatiana Filipenko, 16-year-old Victoria Zalasova, known as Vika, Alexander Crisson, known to his friends as Sasha, who was age 23, 19-year-old Denis Shvachkin, Valentina Utachenko, known as Valia, age 17, and Timur Bapanov, aged 15, all of whom had arrived from Petropavlovsk, Kazakh, and they intended on journeying towards their destination, Slyudyanka, with the highest peak en route being 2,396 metres. The group set off on the 2nd of August and battled horrendous conditions, including torrential rain and snow caused by a Mongolian cyclone. Fortunately, all seven of the hikers were experienced in the field and had no issues with travelling in such adverse weather. Three days later, they had almost reached the peak of Mount Tritrans, where a wooden shelter stood. The wind, snow, rain and mist provided next to no visibility, and with a pine forest two and a half miles or four kilometres down the slope, it would have seemed the wise decision to descend and take shelter. However, for unknown reasons, the group did not seek protection. At 11am on the 5th of August, whilst planning to head for the trees after a night of snowfall, the hikers were startled when suddenly one of their comrades, Sasha Crisson, the strongest person in the group, began to foam at the mouth with blood trickling from his ears. His health quickly deteriorated and he passed away soon after. Unlike the Dyatlov Pass mystery, one of the hikers, Valia Utochenko, recalled the horrifying details of Sasha's death and what occurred next. The group had been collecting dried golden root for most of the day and had been gathering their camping gear. Once Sasha passed away, the group descended into chaos and panic. Dennis then began acting erratically, hiding behind stones and fleeing not far from the camp. Vika and Timur were presumed to have also ran from the group, who had been packing up their tent. The trio reportedly rolled on the ground and took off their clothes and also scratched at their throats. Tatiana repeatedly hit her head against the surrounding stones and Lyudmila Korovina, also recorded in reports as Lyudmila Ivanovna, succumbed to a heart attack and died after having told the group to descend the slope as she stayed by Sasha's side. 
By this point, it was Lyudmila and Sasha who had lost their lives, and Valia attempted to take the reins and lead the group downhill towards the forest. However, the other hikers too quickly died, foaming at the mouth and bleeding from the ears and nose. Moments before his death, Dennis urged Valia to crawl down the slope towards the trees to save herself. Valentina Utachenko was the sole survivor of the incident and provided authorities with an eyewitness account of what happened that day. After watching her fellow hikers perish almost simultaneously in bizarre circumstances, she darted down the slope towards the tree line, haunted by what she had seen. She took her sleeping bag and slept in the forest overnight, ascending to where the six bodies lay the next morning, making sure to close the eyes of the dead. Noticing a trail of the power lines above, she descended towards the Snetsnyaya River, almost unconscious, with the symptoms of a heavy cold. Valentina managed to find a string of abandoned towers where she sheltered along the stream. She was spotted by Ukrainian canoeists on the 9th of August, where she was ultimately rescued and taken to Slyudyanka. For many days, she could not speak. Investigators only managed to get to the scene approximately one month later due to the harsh elements, and once the bodies, which had little clothing and were absent of shoes and socks, were recovered, autopsies were carried out. The hiker's lungs were bruised and there were signs of protein deficiency, thought to have been caused due to undereating. The official causes of death were confirmed as hypothermia, which was further solidified by the evidence of paradoxical undressing and exhaustion from a spontaneous force. However, many questions remained unanswered. What caused the bleeding from the ears was not determined, and how was it possible that all six of the deceased hikers shared the protein deficiency? Valia remembered that the group ate well, therefore this aspect is a mystery. A major theory in the deaths of the Dyatlov group in 1959 included the infrasound theory, which causes bizarre and unpredictable behaviour, effects on the inner ear, disorientation, nausea and resonances within the inner organs, and many speculate whether this actually occurred in this incident. Why did they not complete their journey to the mountain's peak? Did they just lose track of time? Was Lyudmila's trail map inaccurate? They were no more than half an hour's hike away from the peak, although the severe rain no doubt played a part in their decision to temporarily halt their climb. Also, how did Valentina survive the incident? Ludmila, Tatiana, Vika, Sasha, Dennis and Timur were all buried in zinc coffins. In Petropavlovsk, almost the entire 200,000-strong city attended the funerals to say farewell. A few days afterwards, a journalist accused Ludmila Korovina of the hikers' deaths, although no solid evidence supports the theory, and relatives of the deceased do not believe she was involved in the tragedy. Valentina has struggled to come to terms with what she saw and refuses to speak about the incident. Although it is regarded by some as solved, there are mysterious aspects of the case which has left many scratching their heads. For example, how did such a healthy group of young people perish at low altitude in the summer? Senior tourism lifeguard Valery Tatarnikov, who searched for Korovina's group, stated, For me, the death of the Korovinci is a big mystery. Talking of the mountain, he said it is not a desert, not polar ice. If you are an experienced tourist like Korovina was, if you are in the forest in the summer, then it is impossible to die of the cold. 20 minutes to build a fire and you're saved. Valentina Utochenko, who fought against the elements, said in a statement about the incident in a chilling recollection. August 5th, 10am. Chrisin came and said that they were wet and freezing. It was snowing. No landmarks were visible. We collected our backpacks and began to go down the slope. We walked about 10 metres. Chrisin began to fall. They began to pick him up. He fell again. Korovina remained beside him. 
She gave the rest orders to descend, but almost immediately she stopped the group and asked someone to come to her. Tatiana took out an awning and the others took cover under it. I went up to Coravina. Sasha's eyes were huge, indifferent look. Coravina felt for a pulse and said that his heart was not beating. She asked me to drag Vika down. I went up to her and she bit me. I dragged her to the rest of the group. Tatiana began banging her head against the stones. Dennis hid behind the stones and climbed into the sleeping bag. She crawled up to Coravina, but she did not breathe. I tried to raise Timur. When I realised that no one was moving, I began to go down to the trees. I got dressed and lay down in my sleeping bag, covered with an awning. In the morning, I went up, saw Tatiana on the stones, Dennis, Timur, Vika. Above, Sasha and Coravina. None of them rose again. This case is described in the media as unsolved, despite perhaps an obvious conclusion. It is baffling that a case which appears incredibly similar to the Dyatlov Pass incident has not been talked about. However, the more light given to the case, possibly more answers can be found. By the base of the Maritime Alps lies Monte Carlo, located in the Principality of Monaco in the south of France along the French Riviera. It is home to the rich and famous and is known for its casino, opera, stunning sea views by the marina and the prestigious Formula One Monaco Grand Prix, where the world's fastest drivers race around the narrow street circuit. Many also associate Monaco with royalty, more specifically American actress Grace Kelly, who married Prince Rainier III of Monaco and became a Monegasque princess in April of 1956. Monaco has one of the lowest crime rates in the world and has approximately one murder every decade. One of the grisliest crimes in the Principality took place in 1907. Having departed Monte Carlo, a husband and wife stayed in a hotel in Marseille, 137 miles away, with plans to travel to the city of London. The couple abandoned a trunk at the Marseille railway station and began their journey to freedom. A clerk at the station, named Pons, noticed the trunk and was taken aback by a putrid smell. Straight away, he believed it to be the scent of blood. His suspicions were confirmed when he witnessed blood seeping out the bottom of the trunk. Sources differ on how the situation was initially handled, however it was said that, quick to think on his feet, Pons traced the couple and questioned them about why there was blood leaking from the case, and he requested that the pair accompany him to the local police station to open the trunk in order to examine its contents. The unknown man allegedly negotiated with Pons, who was successfully bribed to keep silent. The man and woman insisted that the case contained the remains of freshly slaughtered chickens. However, the French authorities failed to believe their story and questioned them further. The trunk was subsequently opened and within it lay the dismembered body of a woman who had been brutally murdered. Veer San Leisure Gold was born in Clonmel, County Tipperary, Ireland on the 2nd of October 1853 to a wealthy aristocratic family and descended from lines of baronets and earls. He grew up in County Waterford, frequently visiting Dublin in his early years and developed into a charming, charismatic and extremely athletic individual who was talented at sailing, horse riding, boxing, hunting and playing tennis. 
During the summer of 1879, 25-year-old Veer became the inaugural Irish Open champion in Fitzwilliam Square, Dublin, and he progressed to the third Wimbledon Championships, where he impressed his fellow competitors, making it to the men's final, just losing out on the trophy to the only clergyman to win Wimbledon, Reverend John Hartley, who won in straight sets. Rumours circulated that Gold was suffering a hangover during the match. His career appeared to have peaked, as he failed to maintain his form in other tennis events following the final. By 1883, Veer had abandoned his tennis career. Having suffered a string of failures, he turned to whiskey and opium in order to escape his inner turmoil. In 1891, Veer saint Gold married a French dressmaker, Marie Giraudin. The couple had a lavish lifestyle and resided in a home in London. However, it wasn't long until their excessive spending caught up with them. The Golds departed from England and crossed the sea to Canada, where they settled in Montreal and opened a dressmaking business. Once again, their bad spending habits and tendency to gamble regularly buried them deep in debt, and in 1904, the couple moved back to England, choosing to live in Liverpool. Hiding their true financial state, the Golds insisted on others naming them Sir Veer and Lady Gold, masquerading as a couple with almost endless wealth. Veer told many that his older brother was a baronet, which was true, and claimed that he had died in a horse riding accident, therefore the title of baronet passed to him. However, years later, his brother was reported as being alive and well, living in Australia, having dropped his title by choice due to the fact he worked on railways and did not wish to cause any unnecessary rifts with his colleagues. The couple became enchanted by the idea of winning a fortune, and they set their sights on Monaco, where they planned to win thousands, if not millions, in the dazzling Casino de Monte Carlo. Marie had even told her husband that she had cracked the casino system and had the perfect plan to win. The Golds brought Marie's 29-year-old niece, Isabel, with them, and initially found much success, especially at the roulette table. However, as time went on, they began losing more and more. With not a single coin to their name, Veer and Marie acquainted themselves with regular visitors of the casino, wishing for them to give the pair money in order to continue gambling. The Golds became companions to a wealthy, middle-aged Danish widow called Emma Levin, who agreed to loan the Irishman 1,000 francs. The Dane, who was a respectable member of the community, supplied loans to many players, and Marie used this knowledge to her advantage. Emma had been married to Leopold Levin, a successful merchant from Stockholm, Sweden. Their marriage began well, however, the couple fell into an unhappy, childless marriage. After Leopold's death, Emma began living chaotically, spending lots of money, smoking, flirting, drinking until the early hours of the morning, making promiscuous acquaintances and displaying her expensive jewellery. Marie concocted a plot to tarnish Emma's reputation, where she managed to cause problems between Emma and a Madame Castellazzi. Following their feud being published in newspapers, Levin planned on retreating from life in Monaco. Emma received an unsigned note beneath her door which said that Veer's title was not legitimate and the Golds were fraudsters. Before departing Monaco, she told the Golds that she wanted the money loaned to them to be returned to her, but Veer and Marie had no intention of repaying her. 
On the 4th of August 1907, Emma Levin arrived at the gold luxurious rented apartment, believing that she would be receiving her money. However, in a grim twist of fate, she would never leave the apartment with anything, not even her own life. Emma's companion, Madame Castellazzi, was waiting for her at her hotel, but became concerned when she did not turn up to meet her as planned that evening. Castellazzi decided to contact the authorities about Emma's disappearance just after midnight. Monegasque police travelled to the hotel where the Goals were staying and within their suite initially discovered a saw, a hammer and Emma's parasol. Bloodstains were evident all over the apartment. The Golds themselves had stolen 125,000 francs worth of Emma's jewellery, told Isabel they were going to a doctor's appointment for Veer, and fled the hotel with the body of Emma concealed in a trunk, and had taken a train to Marseille, then the trunk was discovered by the porter at the railway station with blood seeping through the fabric. Police took Marie and Veer into custody as authorities investigated the trunk which contained Emma Levin's remains. She was naked, headless, dismembered and disemboweled. Her legs were discovered within a small suitcase, her head was recovered in Marie Gold's hat box and Levin's intestines were found hanging from an iron stake near Monte Carlo by the Côte d'Azur. The case went to trial in December 1907 and the prosecution theorised that Marie Gold was the mastermind behind the murder, despite the Golds saying one of Emma's lovers was responsible and they had concealed the crime in an attempt to avoid being implicated. The prosecution believed that Marie, whose previous two husbands had died in suspicious and mysterious circumstances, persuaded her husband that killing Emma Levin, disposing of her body and stealing her valuables would solve their financial problems. It was thought by the pair that if Emma was invited over to their apartment, she would dress for the occasion in her finest clothes and jewellery. Whilst the trial was ongoing, Veer attacked a prison visitor and his lawyer, which resulted in him losing his defence, and the prosecutor went on to portray him in court as a madman. The public were horrified when it was revealed that the day after the murder, the Golds had eaten meals together at their rented suite, and beneath the table lay a bag with the Scandinavian woman's remains inside. Justice was served for Emma Levin. Veer Sin Laser Gold and his wife Marie were found guilty and convicted of murder, despite the Irishman's insistence that Emma had died at his own hand and had acted alone. He stated that Emma requested around 100 francs to house what she described as an attractive young gentleman, but an intoxicated Gold refused. She allegedly attacked him and he became enraged, grabbing a dagger and murdering her. It seemed odd that she would have asked for money as she had paid a bill in full the evening prior to the incident. Gold also was known to get depressed under the influence of alcohol, not falling into an uncontrollable rage. Marie's statement contradicted her husband's, and she also said that she was not dressed for visitors and left her husband and Emma alone, yet there was evidence proving that Emma had arrived at the hotel suite at 5pm by invitation, and a witness recalled hearing Emma's voice. Shortly after the murder, Marie appeared on the balcony. Marie had told police she had screamed when seeing Emma's body post-mortem, but the witness said no such scream was heard. Emma had been bludgeoned and slashed to death, and found in the apartment was a butcher's knife, a saw, a pestle and an Indian dagger. 
Veer was so drunk when he killed Emma, he couldn't cut through her bones, even with the saw. Therefore, he waited to dissect the body the next morning. Concerned about putrefaction, he disposed of her organs on a nearby beach. The couple packed up their possessions, took the victim's jewellery and fled the scene. Veer was sentenced to life imprisonment and was incarcerated on the Ile du Diable, Devil's Island, a prison in French Guyana notoriously known as Hell on Earth, and Marie was given the death penalty. It was incredibly rare for a woman to be given a harsher punishment than a male at the time and Marie sensationally stated that she wished to be executed in Place du Casino. Her sentence was later downgraded to life imprisonment as Monaco did not have an executioner or a guillotine. Veer Gold took his own life on the 8th of September 1909, after serving less than a year of his sentence, and Marie Gold died in Montpellier jail in 1914 from typhoid fever. It is an extraordinary yet disturbing tale which shook the principality to its core. A bizarre story of a Wimbledon finalist who became a murderer, the early life hardships, followed by a hunt for fortune, a Bonnie and Clyde companionship in the glitz and glamour of Monaco. The plot wouldn't be out of place in a modern film, but it remains a jaw-dropping true story.